Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, October 4th. Today's topic is Revolutionize the Research Process with Google Drive. Your show hosts are Peggy George, Lori Moffitt, that's me, and Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning. Our special guest today is Michael Fricano II. And I will turn the mic over to Peggy to introduce Michael. We are so excited to have Michael Fricano here with us today. Um, Michael is a technology integration specialist for Alani School in Hawaii, among many other things, which you'll be hearing about. One of the wonderful things about participating in webinars like this one, virtual conferences and Google Hangouts, is that you get to meet and learn from amazing educators from around the world. And Michael is one of those amazing educators. I first met Michael when I participated in the Online Gates Summit, uh, Google Applications for Education, and I followed that hashtag, the Gates Summit hashtag. I discovered that Michael was doing a Google Hangout on EdTech Mixed Plate to share resources and ideas that he and his colleagues learned about in the Gates Summit, and I wanted to hear more. So I joined the Hangout and discovered that they were going to be doing a couple of Hangouts on Minecraft, which is another topic I love learning about. So I subscribed to all of the EdTech Mixed Plate notifications and continue to join in every week and now have added this fabulous show to my PLN. They even invited me to join them in a live hangout that they called their Summer PD Roundup, where we all shared some of our favorite experiences over the summer, including ISTE. In every session, I not only learned about great tools and how they were being used in the classroom, but I met some terrific teachers who were eager to share their passions about teaching and learning and who are now also part of my PLN. Whenever I participate in these kinds of webinars or hangouts, I'm always watching for outstanding presenters and leaders who I think could bring great presentations to all of you who join us on Classroom 2.0 Live. So after I heard Michael share about today's topic, revolutionize the research process with Google Drive, I knew it was a perfect topic to share with all of you, and I'm thrilled that Michael accepted my invitation and is joining us today. Now, I'm going to let Michael tell us more about himself as he begins his presentation after the newbie question, because I know that he has a slide that he plans to use that will help to tell that story. So thank you so much for sharing with us today, Michael. And I'm going to ask you the newbie question and then turn the microphone over to you to answer this question and continue your presentation. So we'd like to have you talk to us about why is it important for students to use digital tools for research projects? Take it away, Michael. Oh, thanks for that great introduction, Peggy. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to uh, Lori, Tammy, and Peggy for inviting me on today. I'm very excited to be here. And um, I'm excited to share with all of you from what seems to be all around the world. It's really cool. Um, so I guess, uh, why is it important for students to use digital tools for research projects? Um, I think, uh, number one, these digital tools make it um, easier and more convenient for students con to conduct research. Anything that allows us to uh, save time, uh, make tasks um, a little easier, but also allow us to be more accurate in our work um, is very beneficial to our, you know, to research and to projects in general. Uh, so uh, shall I begin? Absolutely. And you can just advance the slides okay. on your own by clicking that right arrow. Okay. Do, uh, do I share my screen at this point, or just are you guys going to keep it up on the? 
go ahead and follow your slides and then share your screen when you get to the point where you'd like to demonstrate some of those things to us. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, Peggy asked me on today to present uh, a session that I, I've, that I created uh, earlier this year when we had a Google Apps Summit in Hawaii. And uh, so I've shared this, re this presentation a couple times uh, in various um, events. Um, and it's, uh, I, I call it Revolutionize the Research Process with Google Drive. And as you can see there, there is a, uh, a bit.ly link. Um, this bit.ly link will take you to my resource website where this presentation is located as well as um, a handy list of other resources that um, I'll share uh, throughout the presentation. Okay, so uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm very excited to be a soon-to-be dad. My first uh, child will be born at the end of December and um, I'm very excited to be a dad pretty soon. I am an Apple fanboy. I have the uh, trifecta of Apple devices, iMacs, MacBooks, iPhones, um, but I'm also a, a Google geek. And uh, the two can work together fairly seamlessly. And um, I love using both technologies in my personal life and um, at my school. I've been an educator for seven years. Um, I was a, I, I taught kindergarten for about a year and a half. I've taught third and fourth grade. And um, most recently, I've been a technology coordinator for a public elementary school for about four years, where I taught students in uh, grades one through five technology skills. And I was also sort of the uh, go-to IT specialist for fixing and repairing and helping to make technology decisions for the school and providing PD. And uh, starting this year, I became a tech integration specialist for a, uh, a K-12 independent school in Hawaii called Yolati School, which I'm very excited to be a part of. And um, I was, I'm, I'm not currently one, but I was an elementary robotics coach for about five years um, for the first Lego League and uh, RoboFest, if anybody's familiar with those, those competitions. Um, any chance I get to play with Legos with my students? Um, I take, and that was a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully, I could explore that option again in my new school, but not too sure yet. Um, since March of this year, I became an authorized Google Education trainer. Um, and uh, you know, to, to become one of those, you've got to go through a pretty extensive application process, as well as passing a series of Google tests. And so, um, th this title allows me to present on Google Apps on behalf of Google, which I love doing. I take every opportunity I can, like today. Um, and uh, I've been for the past years, and I continue to do that. And of course, I, I have my own um, personal professional blog and website at uh, www.edtechlocation.com. And if you guys are viewing this presentation through my website, you can click on these uh, uh, these icons to access uh, to to um, add me to your Google Plus circles or Twitter or send me an email if you have any questions. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what you know what is involved in the research process. Um, I have a, a very handy uh, kind of a flow chart here. This was originally created by Mary Beth Hertz um, through an article that she wrote for Edutopia, and the source is down there at the bottom. Uh, she's given me permission to recreate her process through this this flow chart and. Um, as I progress through my slides today and, and we talk about uh, the various tools that can be used in the research process, I'm going to jump back to some of these um, steps in the research process to show you how uh, a variety of tools can address uh, some of these, um, uh, these steps. Um, so we'll, we'll be seeing these, uh, these boxes as I progress through my, my presentation. But uh, feel free to check out the the source article was a really great article written by uh, Mary Beth, and she talks a lot about how she teaches the research process and why it's important. Um, I know we come from all over the world. I have a couple slides in here on the Common Core standards for those of us in the U.S. Um, because uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I don't teach uh, um, students specifically. I work directly with with teachers, um, but of course, a lot of us here 
have to address the Common Core standards, and a lot of the standards do address both the research of a, a variety of um, skills that are required in the research process, as well as um, requirements to use a variety of digital tools as students learn. And so being able to address more than one standard through a project is very beneficial to the teacher and the student as the year progresses. And um, most of these research and digital tools related standards are in grade three. And uh, they um, you know, progress up through the grades and get more and more advanced, adding on more skills as the students get older. Um, but I just find it interesting that um, you know, ha teaching students how to conduct research and how do you, and, and requiring them to uh, um, to use a variety of digital tools starts fairly early uh, with students. And um, in my opinion, I think that's a good thing. You know, the earlier we can um, get students involved in researching and using digital tools, the better. The, the more beneficial just to them later on in, um, in their uh, school. And I just uh, have some common core standards. I'm not sure what everybody else uses in other countries, but um, I'm sure you have research standards and digital tool standards. <laughs> okay, so um, in the research tool, which is a part of any Google Doc or Google Slide presentation, um, which is probably one of the uh, uh, most beneficial tools in the research process. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some of some great add-ons that I think to you, a teacher and students can use uh, in a Google Doc as they conduct research, and also how the comment tool and revision history can be used um, to the teachers and the students' advantage while uh, you work through the research process. Okay, so of course I want this to be as hands-on as possible. So. Uh, for all you viewers out there, if you want to open up your own Google document, hopefully you have a, a Google Michael, we're not hearing you right now, and I think it's because you're, you started application sharing, so you have a little bit of a, a bandwidth challenge. Oh, I was afraid of that. We just lost him. He'll be back. <laughs> but um, he even has a direct wired connection, so it's not as wireless. So hopefully uh, that won't happen again um, when he logs back in and starts up application sharing. Uh, hang in with us. It's not your computers. It was Michael's bandwidth. So hopefully he'll be back very quickly. And while you're waiting, uh, go ahead and take a look at um, the Live Binder. And I'll drop that link in again just in case you missed it. And um, you can uh, look at some of his resources while we're waiting for him to come back. Kimberly asks a great question about is there a way to split our screen so we can open a Google Doc on the same page. Uh, just so you know, when you're in Blackboard Collaborate, you're not really in your browser. You join from your browser, but you're not in your browser. So you can actually have your browser open behind Blackboard Collaborate, and then you can click back and forth, if you'd like to, between what's going on in Collaborate and what's in your browser. So that way you can do what Michael was suggesting, which is to um, follow along and try some things. If you have a bandwidth challenge, which means um, not a real strong connection, that may be a problem for you, and you may just want to follow along. But um, I know a lot of times people don't understand that Blackboard Collaborate really isn't in your browser. So hopefully that helps you, Kimberly. 
Yes, Carolyn, and you're correct. You can also reduce the size of the Collaborate window just by dragging that corner over a little bit, and that helps you to see the rest of the screen better. Exactly. Welcome back, Michael. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. We saw it coming. It was, you had some <laughs> bandwidth. We weren't hearing you, and all of a sudden you were gone. So welcome back. Go ahead. Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. My uh, computer froze. I jumped on my, my laptop really quick. Um, so hopefully this, this laptop's a little more advanced. Hopefully it'll handle things a little better. Oh, yes. I'm just going to jump right back into where I left off. Okay, so uh, yeah, so if everybody could get hands on, is that where I left off on this slide? On the let's get hands on. Yes. Not sure where it flows up. Actually, you were just going into application sharing, and you had told us you were encouraging people to try to do things and follow along as you were sharing. So okay. go ahead and try application sharing again. All right. Uh, let's see, back up here. Uh, let's see, let me share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, we're seeing it okay. fine. If, if, okay. if you're on a slow connection, it may load a little slower, but uh, okay. hopefully you'll be able to see it. Great. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, okay, so the first uh, first tool I want to get into is what's called the research tool, which is a feature built into any Google document and any Google slide um, in your Google Drive. And I think that the research tool addresses two parts of the process. Um, when students need to think about the topic that they're researching or the keywords they need to use or search terms, um, the research tool can help them with that, as well as testing these search terms. It's a good idea for students to think about, you know, what are those key words that I need to focus on in my research? What's going to help me, uh, what, which words are going to help me get to the information that I want? And so the research tool can, can definitely help with that part of the process. Okay, so I'm going to show you where the research tool is. Let me just uh, get to a blank document here. Practice document. Oops, it's the wrong one. Okay, so if you open up a Google document in your Google Drive, it could just be a brand new document, a blank one. Okay, and it'll look something like this. Uh, the research tool can be found in the tools menu, which is here up at the top. And the second option you'll see is research. So if you click on the research option here, it'll open up a side panel on the right side of your Google document, and there will be a black bar with the word research in it. So this is the research tool. And the research tool can do a whole lot of really cool stuff. And I'm, I'm going to break down what that research tool does as I progress through my slide here. OK, so um, basically, um, uh, the research tool is like a built-in Google search box. You know, so typically, when students want to conduct research, right, they got to go to, you know, they may go to google.com, not edu, uh, you know, type in their keywords and skim and scan through the options, and then they'll jump back to their document. Or they have a notepad on the side of their computer as they're, um, you know, jotting down notes. Well, students, instead of having them to, to uh, you know, switch between tabs, they can do all of that Google searching through the research tool. So it's all built into the document. So the student doesn't have to leave that document as often. And so there's a search box at the top. And this is basically a Google search box where students can type in their, their, uh, their words. Say I'm looking for information on Christopher Columbus. You can type that into the box. And it will automatically start uh, searching for information related to my topic. So for those of you, uh, for, uh, uh, for the viewers out there, go ahead and type in a, a keyword. Um, you can look for a famous person or your favorite food or a favorite place you like to visit and see what the uh, research box finds for you. 
Um, in the search box, there's a little uh, icon on the left side, and this is the filter um, option. This will uh, filter the type of um, uh, search uh, the type of things that, that the uh, research tool will find for you. So if you click on a little filter option, you have a list of filters that you can choose from. Right now, and by default, it's set to everything. So Google will find, it will show you everything in the research box. As you can see here, it shows, it shows me pictures that I can cycle through. Um, depending on what you're searching for. In this case, I'm searching for a famous person, so it's giving me, it's pulling this information from the Wikipedia article, some basic information about the person I'm looking for. And then below that are the uh, web results, which we'll get into a little further in a minute. But um, maybe you don't want everything. Maybe students just want to look for pictures. Well, they can filter that by choosing the images filter. And that's marked by a little camera. And it will just show the user pictures instead of all those other um, you know, uh, uh, web results and things. So now I can just scroll through pictures of my search term, my keywords. Um, you can also search through scholarly works, like research papers and reports and things like that that Google has archived in its uh, search database. Uh, you can filter by quotes. So maybe you want to find a quote by a particular person. You can search for that. There's also a built-in dictionary. So uh, if students want to define a word as they're searching, they can use the dictionary. Um, there's also an option for personal. So if you use like, a, if you have a Google Plus account um, and use a variety of different Google apps with your Google account, the personal will search your, your personal connections for um, anything related to your search terms. Um, and there's also tables. So if you, if you or your students need to find tables of data, um, you can uh, use the tables option. And in this case, it's finding, uh, I don't know what these are, but uh, it's just uh, tables of data. Oh, this is from a Christopher Columbus High School. Looks like there's sports data. And you can pull in these tables of data and use it in your research if, if your students need to. I see, uh, I'm trying to keep up with the chat, and I see some uh, questions here. Uh, let's see, who was it? Um, someone asked, can, yes, Susan asked, can you drag and drop? Yeah, you can, with the, with the image, with the images filter. Um, if students want to use these pictures, it's just a simple click and drag into the document, and it'll add that picture to your document. So really, a really cool option there. And um, as you notice, there's a little footnote here next to my picture. So what the research tool does a really good job of is, is um, uh, citing a student's sources, whether it's a picture or a, a web result. And we'll get into that a little further. But every picture you drag in gets a footnote. And that footnote, if you look at the bottom of your screen, um, contains the direct link to that image from that, that website. It's so really useful for students. So uh, they don't have to worry about creating that citation themselves. So they have a direct a direct link back to that picture if they need it. Okay, so that's the filter. Um, if you want to learn more about the filter, I have a link here in my presentation, which uh, takes you to the Google support page and, and um, shares a little bit more information about uh, what each of those filters um, uh, does for you. So you can check that out on your own if you need to, if you'd like to. Um, and so with, with each slide here, I, I wanted to focus on you know, when students begin their search, what are some things they, they should consider? Um, and these are things that, that I, I try to address with my students as I'm teaching them these tools and working with them on a research project. So of course, when students are conducting research and they're typing in keywords and they're getting a bunch of web results, uh, one thing I talk to them about are, um, you know, what are the different domain names and, and what do they mean? And by domain names, I mean those, those last three letters typically at the end of a site. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, so that may be a .org site or a .edu or a .gov. Um, there's a variety of different domain names, and, and each of them um, means something specific, and based on what they mean could determine whether it's a reliable source or not. Now, we may run into a lot of .coms, and um, a website that's a .com can come from uh, practically anybody in the world, and that, that can be a little more difficult to uh, 
um, to determine if that's a reliable source. But websites with .edu's come from educational institutions, so a little bit more reliable. Um, .gov comes from governments, which can be a little bit more reliable. So if students understand what those domain names, um, they can. Uh, it's uh, it's a little easier for them to decide which websites they want to choose. Also, what are some effective Google search strategies? Of course, uh, Google is most known for its capabilities to scour the internet and find things that you want. And there's some tips and tricks that you can use in the search box um, to help narrow down your, your choices. And so uh, there's a link here to some helpful tips in conducting Google searches, um, which are, are very useful for the teacher and the student in um, you know, really narrowing down the amount of opt the amount of you know results that you get, and then also what are those key what keywords are associated with the topic? The 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 more specific your keywords are, the, then the more specific your your search results become. And so um, picking the, the the best words in your research will uh, allow your students to find the most um, important uh, information. Okay, so the re we're going to continue with the research tool because there's a a lot of things you can do with it. Um, so another option in the research tool allows you to um, uh, think about evaluating those sites, determining what's, uh, what's reliable, what's important, what's going to help me with my project, what's going to give me the most information. And so that option is the preview option in the research tool. So I'm going to jump back to my document. Okay, so um, I'm searching for information on Christopher Columbus. And if you scroll down, you want to look for the web results, as listed here by the title. So these are all the websites that are related to your search terms. Okay? And um, the research tool will put them in handy boxes here. And if you hover your mouse over a web result, you get this box with three buttons at the bottom. And every, every uh, web result has that box with the three buttons. Okay? The first button is the preview button. When you click the preview button, it's going to open up a side panel and it's going to give you a sneak peek at that website. It's going to show you what that entire page looks like if I were to click on that blue link. So before a student even clicks the blue link and it takes them to a new tab of that website, I always recommend that they preview it first. Now, of course, you can't read any of, the, of what this says because it's so small, but it does give you a glimpse into that site and it can help students determine whether um, it's worth visiting or not. Uh, in this example, I see a lot of text, a couple of paragraphs. I see a picture of Christopher Columbus. I see a nice title. Um, so, you know, based on what I see, I can determine whether it's worth actually visiting. And um, you can uh, toggle the preview option on and off just by clicking on that button. And the next one is from history.com, and if I look at that, I preview it, it looks like it's just a video. So maybe right now I'm not looking for videos, I'm looking for, for text, I'm looking for paragraphs of information. So by previewing this, I can determine that I don't want to visit that website and I can skip it and move on to the next one. Okay, so it, it can save the student time in, in clicking on the links and actually going to that website just by previewing it. So it's a very handy tool and, and of course that, that helps the student to evaluate the sites as they're conducting research. Um, I do want to share a tip with the preview, and it's something that I didn't think about. It's something that one of my students kind of brought up on his own. But um, as students are, are you know, scrolling through this list of web results, you know, there's so many of them listed here. And if a student were to click on one and go to that website, it's going to take them to a new tab to that website. They can, you know, they can skim and, and read and look at the pictures. But oftentimes, my students notice that when they jump back to their document, they forget which site they, they actually visited because there's so many there. You know, and sometimes we're so absent-minded in our thinking and our, and our process that we forget those things. So one of my students noticed that when you click the preview button, um, it puts a little red line next to it. And I don't know if you guys can see that on your end. So what he thought what would be a good idea is before a student clicks on the blue, they should preview it, keep the preview open so the red line is there. Then he can go and visit that site, conduct his research. And when he comes back to his document, he'll know which site he was on 
because it's marked by the red line. I thought that was a really cool idea for using the preview. It's kind of a, you know, a, a different way of thinking about how we use these tools. And, and one of my students came up with that on his own, which I thought was a great idea. So that's just a quick tip on how the students can use the preview tool to keep track of where they are. Uh, so that, that red line there will, will mark the site. And then when a student moves on to the next one, they can just preview it. And now that site is marked with the red line. So just a quick tip there. Uh, so that's the preview tool. Great for evaluating sites. Okay. And of course, you know, what, do, what do students need to consider when they're evaluating? So how do they, how do they know that the site, even though they can see it with the preview tool, how do they know it's a reliable source? And so I have a link here to uh, a great source of information by um, Kathy Schrock. She has a, uh, here's her website, Guide to Everything. And she has a post about critical evaluation of information. And there are just tons and tons of resources that she's um, pulled together for us here. Um, there's lessons on uh, um, uh, site evaluations. Uh, she has, there's just lots of them here. Um, where is it at? Uh, she also has, Looks like this is kind of reorganized since the last time I saw it. There's also some uh, documents that she's created that you can download and uh, have your students fill out to um, uh, 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 to evaluate their, their, their uh, the sites and the sources that they're using. So this is a great resource. So uh, you know, use that to help your students determine how they can evaluate and how they can make sure that their sites are, are reliable. Um, you know, when they're using the preview tool, they have to ask themselves questions. You know, is, is this site trying to sell me something? A lot of these sites try to sell videos about Christopher Columbus or, um, you know, pictures and things like that. And that may not be the best place to go. So the preview tool can help kids quickly determine that, the answer to that question. Um, does the site contain enough in, um, images and information? Is it just a couple sentences with a picture? Or is it par paragraphs and paragraphs of information that could be useful? And um, students also have to think about how many other sources do they have. I tell my, I, I typically have my kids find three separate sources of information. Even if those three sources have the same exact information, uh, that helps them um, to determine whether that information is reliable. If three separate sources give you the same information, then it's more believable than three separate sources giving you three different types of information. So having more than one source is, you know, uh, of course, a must in the research process. Okay, the next tool in the research, the next feature in the research tool can help students to gather their information, um, help them, you know, try to understand and follow copyright law and not, and not plagiarize, and also help them to create citations as, uh, you know, students are required to do and as they uh, finish up a research project. And so the first, uh, tool here, uh, the, the, the next tool after preview is the insert link. So I'm going to jump back to my document here. So we talked about preview. Uh, the next tool, that, uh, the next button after that is the insert link button. Okay, so let me just say as an example, I'm going to go into this great Wikipedia article. Okay, I've got a couple paragraphs of information here. So I'm just going to grab this information from my research and paste it in. Okay, so now I have some good information from this Wikipedia article, but I need a way to get back to it easily. And the insert link button will do that. So wherever your cursor is um, in your document, when you insert a link, it'll create a, a link in the document there. Come on, try again. There we go. It'll create a handy link. It'll take the title of that site, use it as the name of the link, and it'll create a link back to that source for the student. So I always tell the students, after you're done pulling information into your document, insert the link so you have a way back to that source if you need to go back to it later. And so I could, I could click on that link in the document to take me back to that Wikipedia article. So the insert link will, will create that for you and the students um, as, a, as an easy way back to your sources. There you go. Okay. okay, so that's the insert link. It creates a link to the website in your document. And then there's the ever-powerful site tool. So the site tool creates a footnote 
and it, and it generates a citation of that website resource. So this is probably the best part of the research tool. So um, the, the third button here in, in a web result is uh, the cite tool. So it'll, it'll create a footnote wherever your cursor is in your document. So I typically have kids um, insert the link and then put the, um, and, and then cite it next to the link. So if I were to cite this Wikipedia article here, it creates a little footnote starting with number one. And that footnote corresponds to a, an automatically generated citation at the bottom of my document. Really awesome. Right, so it does that automatically for the kids. And so when the students are ready to, to put together that um, a, a bibliography, all they have to do is copy and paste that citation into the bibliography page. And some of you may wonder if you can change the citation format, and you can. So right below this the search box here, oops, is a little down arrow. And if you click on that down arrow, you have some, some settings here. Uh, one of the settings is the ability to filter your images by usage rights, which is really cool. Okay, but the other option is to change the citation format. I think by default it's set to MLA, but some students require APA. I mean, some teachers require APA, and some teachers require Chicago. So depending on what the teacher requires, students have the option to change that citation format. So. If I wanted my students to use Chicago, they would have to change that, that setting in their research tool. And then um, if I start over again, I could cite it again. And now I have uh, uh, my citation in, in the Chicago format. So a very powerful tool there. I know uh, some of us may use um, EasyBid, uh, which I'm going to get into a little later. But um, the research tool does that citation automatically for you, which is Super cool, very easy for students. Uh, so, you know, and I have a quick tip there. Um, you know, make sure your students understand that when they insert these links and these citations, it's going to go wherever the cursor is. Sometimes our students don't realize where their cursor is, and they just start clicking these buttons, and then they have no idea where their citation went. Um, so they have to understand where their cursor is before they choose to insert a link or, or, or uh, click the cite button. Okay, and of course some things to consider. So um, are they, you know, as they're conducting their research, are they gathering too much unnecessary information? Some students just like to copy, paste, and gather everything they find, and that's not really necessary. It's just going to create more work for themselves. So they have to make sure that they're gathering just enough uh, for their project, maybe a little more, um, but not too much. And they have to make sure that it's, it's focused. It's not, it's not unnecessary information. Um, again, do they have multiple sources of information? They shouldn't just be relying on one source. That's not a good idea in the research process. Do they have a way back to that source? So the insert link option and the cite tool both give them uh, give students a, a way back to that source. And um, are they citing their sources? And when a student's gathering information from a, a website source, they should be citing it. And um, sometimes I have students that forget to cite it. And when they get to the part where they're creating their project and, and pulling information from the sources, I have to tell them you can't use that because you didn't cite it. You have no way of going back to that source and therefore you have no way of informing your, your audience of where you got that information from. So they have to understand that that's an important step in the research process uh, of citing their sources. And of course, do students understand why we have citations and why they're important? Students have to understand that. You can't just tell them, cite your sources, without them understanding why you're asking them to do that. And I have some, uh, so, uh, some resource links here to, that kind of explains the importance of citations and why we do that. So feel free to explore those. And do students know proper citation format? So when they ask you, when you ask them for MLA or APA or Chicago, they should understand what those differences are and why you're asking them for a specific format. So as the teacher, we have to explain that to them often. Okay, I think that's it for the research tool. Um, I don't know, is there, are there any questions out there about the research tool? Has anyone had a chance to explore it? It's probably the, uh, the best part of using Google Docs for research. 
Oh, uh, Peggy's asking, when do you introduce those formats? Um, you know, when I was teaching third and fourth grade, I didn't focus too much on the formats, just helping the students to understand that um, they should have a citation and understanding why it's important that we cite our sources. Um, I think at my school, students were learning about formats in fourth and fifth grade, although you could probably start addressing it in third grade. I, I don't see why not. Um, I think it's you know it's it's more imp it's important that they first understand you know the why and um, and they understand how to do it. Okay, so next up in my presentation, I'm going to talk about some Google Docs add-ons. Um, so in in a Google document, back in the menu bar, you have um, a menu option called add-ons, and this is fairly new. It was just introduced. Um, um, I think uh, a, a little bit before summertime, um, near the beginning of, of this calendar year. It's a new feature in uh, Google Documents and Google Sheets. And add-ons um, allow you to, to add extra features to your documents. And so I'm going to share a couple of my favorite add-ons for the research process. And these add-ons that I'm going to showcase um, help students to gather information. They help them to to follow copyright laws. They help them to create citations and gather their sources. And uh, these add-ons also help to synthesize information and to share results. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So add-ons are, are tools that add extra features to your documents and spreadsheets. Uh, Kaizena is an add-on. I see Sophia there mentioning Kaizena. Kaizena is an add-on. Um, so if you, if in, once you get into add-ons, you can, you can search for that. As you can see here in my my um, screenshot, Kaizen, is in there. Um, if you want to, uh, I have a link back to the official Google announcement back in March when add-ons were first released, so feel free to check that out. Okay, so here's some great add-ons for research. The first add-on, of course, is the EasyBib Bibliography Creator. So let me show you how to get to that add-on. Okay, so again, back in the document, you're going to go to the add-ons menu option. And I have a lot of add-ons already already added to my document. If you don't have any added yet, then your list is going to be a lot shorter than mine. But at the bottom of the list is the option to get add-ons. So go ahead and click on that. It's going to open up the add-ons menu. Okay, and you could scroll through. There's lots of great add-ons, and more and more add-ons are being um, added to the menu uh, you know, every single month. So great options here. But you can actually conduct a search in the search box. So if you don't see EasyBib at the top like I do, go ahead and just type in EasyBib and press return. And it'll, it'll search for um, that, that add-on based on your, your keywords. Okay, so once you, once you get to the EasyBib bibliography creator, you, uh, you'll likely have a blue button here. So go ahead and click on that blue button. And then um, it'll ask you, um, to accept uh, permission because uh, every add-on has different permission requests into your Google account. Um, so go ahead and accept that. Um, I've already added EasyBib to my doc to my my uh, Google account, but uh, go ahead and add EasyBib to yours. And once you add it, it'll get um, it'll be placed in your add-ons menu, and it'll always be there after you add it the first time. So it'll always be in this menu here. Okay, and as you can see near the top of my list, I have the EasyBib Bibliography Creator. Okay, and if this didn't open for you already, you can go into the add-ons menu and choose Manage Bibliography. So I'm going to do that. It's going to work. It says working. And uh, most of these add-ons will open up the side panel for you. So the research tool will disappear, and the site of source um, uh, side panel will open up. Okay. So if you're not familiar with EasyBib out there, EasyBib is a, it's a, a website where students and teachers can go to to create citations. They do have a paid, a, a pro version that allows students to do a whole lot more with citations. Um, so that's an option for schools. But EasyBib created an add-on for Google Docs that allows students to, uh, to quickly gather citations and then, cr and then automatically generate a bibliography. So I want you to check this out. So in this add-on, Students can create citations for a book, a journal article, 
or a website. And depending on which option you choose, you have to do a search for it. So if you, students are using a book for their research, they could, they could search it by title, the ISBN number that's on the back near the UPC label, or they can use keywords. Um, or they can, uh, if they know the website URL, they can, they can create a citation by pasting in the URL. So let's say, for example, I have this Wikipedia article. I'm going to grab the URL here and paste it into the search box. And I'm going to do a search. So EasyBib is going to look for it. If it finds the website, it's going to give me a, a result here. Okay, as I see here, Christopher Columbus Wikipedia. And I can select this from EasyBib. And if I select it, it will get added to my list of citations that I've already created here. So as students work through their document and their research, they can they can um, go back and add more citations um, with the EasyBib uh, bibliography uh, creator here. And um, it, it will save the work. So even if I close this, this tab here and I go back into it again, it'll still be there. So it saves it based on the document that I'm in. There it is. Okay. Once students gather up their citations, there's a big red button here that says Add Bibliography to Doc. Okay. So when I do that, it's going to create a bibliography page for me and attach it to my document. I'm going to move this down. So here, EasyBib has created my works cited page and has listed my uh, three citations. Okay, so, so uh, really powerful there. I know um, students sh struggle a lot with making sure that, that that works cited or that bibliography is formatted correctly. Okay, and um, uh, the EasyBib can, can uh, you know, do that for you or, or at least get students started. And of course, students can choose the citation format that their teacher requires, MLA, APA, or Chicago. So they have that option as well. Okay, so that's one of my favorite um, add-ons for the research process because of how easy it is to pull in those citations and then create the bibliography for the students. Super easy. Uh, and it says down here, check out EasyBib Pro. The Pro does a whole lot more. I'm not um, extremely familiar with the Pro features, but I mean, I, I think the add-on does quite a bit already, and it's very useful for students. And when you're done with that add-on, the add-on, you can just click the X to close it. Okay? And as I as I uh, uh, as I demoed earlier, you can always jump back into it by going to the add-ons menu. And, and those citations will always be saved in the document. Okay, and um, I have a quick link to that add-on here. If you if you click on add, it'll take you straight to that add-on, and you can add it to your document later on if you haven't done so already. Okay, and the other add-on I wanted to demo is uh, called Text Help Study Skills. Okay, and again, there's a there's a direct link here. But uh, if you're in your document and you go back to the add-ons menu. Go ahead and get add-ons again, as, uh, like we did before for EasyBib. And just search for text help. And it should, it should find this add-on here, text help study skills. Text help study skills is an app by uh, Read and Write for Google, which is a Chrome extension that um, schools can purchase for their students. It offers um, a lot of different tools in, in a Google document, but one of their tools is the highlighting tool. So they've created a separate add-on that you can use with your document. So go ahead and add that, um, add that, that add-on to your Google document. So click the blue button and uh, uh, give it permission to access your account. Okay, and once you, uh, once you add it, it should be in your list here. So you see your text help study skills. And if it hasn't opened already, you want to choose the option Show Highlighting Tools. Okay, so the Text Help Highlighting Tool, it's a tool that allows students to highlight their, their research. And this would be you know, as you know, part of the step where they're starting to uh, gather information, starting to uh, uh, synthesize 
the information, determining what's important and what they what they want to use in their project. And the highlighting this highlighting tool has four highlighting colors: yellow, blue, green, and pink. Okay. So as students are are reading through their research, they you know, it's a good idea that they highlight those important pieces of information. Okay. So um, for example, born between 31 and 30. So I'm going to make that pink. Uh, here, he died May 20th, 1506. He was an explorer, a navigator, a colonizer. Okay, and there's four different colors. So sometimes I'll I'll have the students uh, choose a color based on the kind of information that they're gathering. So maybe if I'm looking for information about his early life, I want it to be pink. And uh, maybe if I'm looking for information about his travels, his explorations, um, I could uh, highlight in green. So here's um, I'm highlight this in green. His first voyage was in 1492. Okay, and so I can continue that process of highlighting. So that's a pretty basic um, option there. Okay, highlighting. Now, what text help does with the highlighting. Um, uh, with, with the highlighted text is what makes this add-on uh, extremely powerful. So once students are done highlighting, there's an option here in the sidebar called collect. So when students are done highlighting, they can collect the highlights. So I'm going to click this button. This box will pop up. And I have an option for sorting my highlighting. So I can either sort my highlighting marks based on where their position is in the document, or I could sort those highlighting marks by the color that I used. I'm going to sort by color, and then I'm going to collect highlights. So what, what this add-on does is it, it creates a separate document, and it pulls all of the highlighting marks out of your research document into a separate document, leaving all of that extra stuff behind. And so now I have a, a, a link here that I can click on. So I'm going to click on this link. It's going to take me to my separate document, and here I have just uh, the information that I highlighted, along with my email address and a link back to that original research document. So that's I think that's extremely powerful for helping students to gather up that important information and to help synthesize information that they're they're finding. So now all of that extra stuff that I deemed um, not necessary is gone, and I'm left with those those important key pieces of information. Okay, so really cool add-on. That's a that's called text help highlighting tools. Okay, and uh, just a disclaimer, although I, I'm not too sure why, according to the the description of the add-on, because this is this add-on is kind of like a it's like a trial period for the the more advanced um, uh, uh, read and write for Google extension. Um, so according to the description, uh, you get the four colors for, I think, 30 days, and then it removes blue, green, and pink, and you only get yellow. And then you have to go to their website and purchase their extension to get all of their, their functions and features. Um, but for some reason, I still have the four colors. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that 30-day trial is still in effect. They may have turned that off. But, I mean, just, just highlighting in yellow and collecting all those highlights is um, still extremely powerful, so it's still a uh, you know worth having you and your students use. I think. Okay, so those are just two add-ons that I wanted to demo because they I think they help the research process um, extremely well. <clears throat> um, so uh, two more. I'm just going to quickly uh, breeze through here. Um, of course, with any Google document or actually any Google file, there's the commenting tool. I think a lot of teachers use that for providing feedback and uh, supporting students. Um, it's built into any Google document. And depending on who you have it shared with, if you're collaborating between students or collaborating between teacher and students, um, everyone has the option to, uh, uh, to comment. But um, the comment tool can be used for, um, uh, uh, can be used in other ways. So in, in my examples of conducting research, I had my students use the comment tool um, on their own documents. So they commented on, on themselves as they conducted research to mark certain spots in their, 
in their research. You know, so instead of maybe using the highlighting tool, students would highlight important pieces of information and add their own comments. And they would say things like um, early life comment. And then here, you can add another comment, early life. And then I could get into uh, down here and I can add another comment and say voyages. So I had the students use this commenting tool to mark their paper based on the kinds of information I wanted them to find. So you know, it's not just for a teacher to provide feedback, but it can also be used for a student to track their own um, uh, researching process. And so um, I think I have an example here in my slide. Yeah, if you click on this student sample here, this is an example of a student I had who used the commenting tool to mark up their, their research. So if I scroll down here a little bit into the nitty gritty here. So in this case, students were researching um, uh, um, uh, endangered species of Hawaii. And you can see here, this student was adding comments to their research about the different kinds of things that they were required to find. I'm sorry, Peggy, I'm taking a little longer than I expected myself to. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, so I, I thought that, that that was a great use of the comment tool. Um, you know, being able to use it in multiple ways um, is a great idea, and so I have a sample there for you guys to check out. And of course, there's the, uh, the ever handy revision history. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, uh, if students share their research document with the teacher, the teacher has the option to go into that revision history to see um, you know, when the student uh, worked on their research, uh, what changes they've made, what things they've added. And um, the revision history kind of breaks that down by timestamps here. So if I were the teacher looking at Michael's document, I could I could see that he worked a lot of, he worked a lot on that document today and he even worked on it back in September seventh. So having that research history can help teachers to determine you know, who's doing their work, how often they're working on it. Um, if, you're, if it's a collaborative research project and you have multiple kids working on one research document, the teacher can track who's, who's doing their work and who's not doing their work. So it's a really great way for um, the teacher to monitor uh, student work. And that's, I'm, I'm sure, I can't remember, that's in file under revision history. It's in the file menu of the Google document. You just have to make sure that students share their document with you in order for you to see that. Okay, so um, coming up to the end of my presentation, I do have some student samples and examples that, uh, that, that um, I, you are more than welcome to view and make copies of and share. Um, so uh, in the beginning of my, of using Google Docs for research, uh, this was kind of like the first example. This was before I decided to use a template. And um, if you click on this option, it was, I, I basically just had students kind of throw everything together in, a, in one document, just copy, paste, and pull in pictures. And um, it, it was it kind of, it was very disorganized. We, we really, students had a hard time figuring out where everything was in their document. And it was all kind of just cluttered together like this. Um, so that was kind of my first first trial run, but then after that first project, I realized that it would be a lot easier if students had um, a template that they could use to help keep themselves organized. So I created a template here that um, you guys are more than welcome to make a copy of and edit and change if you need to. And this allowed the students to uh, keep things organized into these handy tables that I generated for them. And of course, I, I put their criteria at the top so they know what's required of them during research. And then down here, I created a table where they, they can copy paste information that they find in a website. Here, they would include their footnote citation. And then in this box, they would insert the link. And I also put in little screenshots of those buttons for them. Okay, and I, I it, students, and I realized that this was a lot easier, a lot, um, it allowed students to um, keep things a little more organized, keep things neater, and they were able to find information a lot faster. So that template is in my presentation and on my website. Um, and of course, uh, feel free to make a copy and uh, use it and share it if you like. And you can also edit it and, and turn it into your own. 
And of course, I just want to jump back from, you know, uh, revisit that research process. So using these, these built-in tools and add-ons and features in Google Docs um, pretty much allows the teacher and the student to address um, all, the, all of the steps in the process. And it, it can really help to uh, make the process more efficient makes um, a couple of these these steps a little easier for teachers and students to manage. And um, by making things more efficient and easier, it's a, a little bit more enjoyable for the students to do and a lot more interesting as they work through their project. <coughs> okay, so if you guys have any questions or comments or you need any extra help about what I shared today, feel free to send me an email. I have my email link there. It's on my website as well. If you're on Google+, make sure you add me to your circle. I'm, uh, I'm most often on Google Plus sharing and um, participating in discussions. You can follow me on Twitter. And then, of course, check me out on my website, www.edtechnocation.com. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Sorry for going over uh, a little bit there, everybody, but thanks for hanging in with me. And um, I think I'll pass it back over to Peggy. I did manage to catch some questions, Michael, that you didn't ask. Um, this particular person wrote, I don't understand why we need a citation when we already have the link. Some citations give the date access. I know the links break, go away, but how does the citation help with that? Well, I think in, in most research projects, teachers require students to have a bibliography mm -hmm. for a works cited page. And the citations help your your audience to know where those resources came from. The um, In my example of collecting research, that, that research document would just be for the student and maybe the teacher as they're mm -hmm. gathering research. But when they get to that end product, that whether it's a research paper or some kind of project, uh, there should always be a um, a page or a slide or something in that project that that allows the audience to know where that information comes from. And that's what a citation does. Okay. Um, you listed a couple of Google add-ons. Which are your favorites and can can you really talk, can you add verbal comments to a student's paper? Uh, yeah, the, the Kaizena add-on allows mm -hmm. you to add um, voice comments to students' work. I think what mm -hmm. the Kaizena add-on does is it, it takes a student's Google document and it pulls it out into um, uh, Kaizena's website. And then um, and Kaizena's site, teachers can add voice comments and then they can send that document back to the students and the students can listen to those voice comments. So that's a really great add-on if students want to provide um, verbal feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, any, there's so many great add-ons. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, another great add-on that I like, and um, our audience can explore this one a little later, it's called Grading Help, which is uh, it's an add-on that allows the teacher to quickly attach um, f uh, 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 feedback in the comments. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's mainly for like um, uh, for when students write a, uh, um, like a, a, a research paper or they're, 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 writing, they're doing some kind of writing. So it, it allows the teacher to add, to quickly add comments about like paragraph structure, spelling, you know, all of those things that we often look for in a paper when we're um, providing feedback to students. So uh, grading help is a really good add-on. Can they use EasyBib if their papers are in Spanish? Well, that's a good question. I've never explored add-ons in a different language. So I'm, okay. uh, unfortunately, I'm not, not really sure how that would work out. OK. There was a related question to that about if add-ons will work in another language, but that, I think, answers that one as well. Yeah. Uh, how do you clear like parts of the um, 
information the research tool gathers uh, if you are then working on another project. Well, um, the, if you're working on another project, of course you would create a separate uh, Google document to gather mm -hmm. research. And uh, whenever you create a new document, the, re the research tool kind of resets itself in that document. Oh, okay. Good. Yes. Good. So it, it it's it's smart enough to know that you have a, a different file open and resets. Yeah. It's all it, it basic. The research tool basically works. Um, it, it's connected to whatever um, uh, uh, information you have in that mm -hmm. document. So. If you have a new document, you'll have kind of a refreshed and new research tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think those were the questions that I gathered. I don't see any newer ones. Yeah, those are well, sharing with questions. groups would be just setting up a whole list of emails that you can that you share that. Yeah. Yeah. The students would need their own emails to do that. Yes. I think. Yeah, this is this is all assuming that the teacher and the students have their own uh, Google Apps for Education accounts. Right. Which, which a school can sign up for. Right. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I think we're about ready to close the show now. You're welcome. And uh, thanks for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. This is a fun experience. <laughs> and I, I'll turn the mic over to Peggy, who will take over for the upcoming shows. Thank you so much, Michael. This was awesome. And I, for one, can't wait to go back and watch the recording so I can pause and go look those things up as you go along. But thank you so much. I know we're over time, so I just want to quickly tell you about upcoming shows because we have some great shows and we need you, especially for the next show. If you were with us before, we did another open mic session on blended learning that Paula Nava led for us. Next week, we're going to try it again. And we're going to focus on digital storytelling. And Wes Fryer is going to be our facilitator. And why it's so important that you're there is we need you to come Get on the mic and tell us what you're doing with digital storytelling. It could be browser-based. It could be app-based. It could be without any technology at all. But tell us what you're doing with your students for digital storytelling. And the entire session will be based on input from everyone in the session. So there won't be a presentation, but we have a master uh, in West Fryer with digital storytelling, and he'll guide the conversation, and he'll definitely be sharing some of his resources. I think that, in particular, he plans to talk about the YouTube Creator Studio that was just added this summer. So that'll be, be great. So please come next Saturday at the same time. The following week, October 18th, we have a great show coming up with Alice Keeler, and she's going to talk all about Twitter chats. What are they? Why do you use them? How do they work? When are they held? And it will give us all the inside scoop on how to participate in Twitter chats. No show October 25th, because that's the dim fall virtual, virtual conference. They're calling it a streamathon this year. And then November 8th, our November featured teacher is Jamie Reynolds, who is an amazing librarian. So I know that she will have some great things to share with us. November 15th, Lisa Schmucky, who is the CEO of edweb.net, is going to join us with a panel of teachers and principals and talk about all the free PD you can get on edweb.net. Lots of communities, lots of different topics, and you're going to want to learn all about that if you're not following it already. Then we're going to have another Google Drive, Google Classroom show with 
Lisa Thuman, who is a real pro with everything Google related, and she'll be November 22nd. No show on Thanksgiving weekend for the United States. So lots of great things coming up. I hope you'll come back for all of them. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Lori, take us out. Thank you, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's newest endeavor. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including the Host Your Own Webinar series. So you can effectively reserve a Blackboard Collaborate room like this show is, is in. As long as you make your session public, uh, you can host a, a show or a session yourself. You can nominate a featured teacher by filling out the form at tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher nominate without the e at the end. Um, each month, we, we have a featured teacher. And you can even nominate yourself if you would want to do so. As you exit the session, the survey for the show should open up. It, the link is al also already in the chat blog. And there's a tab in each of the Classroom 2.0 Live Binders for the uh, survey. At the bottom of the survey, you'll find information about requesting a professional development certificate. Uh, please, when you put in an email address for that, please make it a personal email address rather than a school email address because schools tend to block this particular email from arriving to your inbox. Uh, what's new about the certificates is that your name gets printed on the uh, in the document itself now. And also please make sure you you request that within a few hours of the the show today because they get they get printed up in a group. There is both a video collection and an audio collection of shows at uh, iTunes U. So you can go to this link and request one and or both of these collections so you can access these on mobile devices. There's also an RSS feed of the show archive. So you can click on this and have the list appear in a feed reader as well. So there are many ways to get to the archived shows. Special thanks again to Michael Fricano, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing the website, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you so much for coming. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>